everyone. I'm Dina. And I'm Charlotte. Welcome to the Grim Curriculum Extra Credit. Hello, hello. Hello. How are you doing this fine, sunny Sunday? Honestly, it is beautiful outside. It is hot as hell, but I am all for it. It is gorgeous. The sun is out. Oh, I love it. I'm in my blanket for it right now, but I'm going to go back outside after this. Same. I was outside a little bit this morning and I was sitting on our chairs in the sun with my tea and uh, I was thoroughly enjoying it, but it's very toasty in here right now with the blanket fort up, so... If I'm sweating my booty off by the end of it, that's why. <laughs> oh my God, absolutely. I think about the day someday when we have like an actual recording studio type thing mm-hmm. without yeah. blankets. Oh my God. Uh, after this, I will definitely be diving into the basement where it is nice and cool. And I'm going to be diving back into Hyrule because I'm playing the new Zelda. And I know you are too. So, Oh my goodness. I, I haven't had a lot of time to play it. But Ugh. every moment of my spare time has been devoted to that game. And I am staying up to like, hey, this is anyone who knows me knows this is a big deal. I am staying up until like midnight playing it. Dang, it is like sucked you in. Yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I was a big Breath of the Wild fan before anyway. And I have been excited for the release of this game. And I, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. And I'm very much enjoying like out on the internet seeing everybody's wild ass inventions and creations the absolute creativity people have when it comes to this is so cool i'm loving it although some people are a little unhinged and you might want to have a word with yourself i'm looking at you guys the ones that are crucifying koroks stop it that honestly i you know (laughs) i'm not even surprised i didn't know that was a thing until right this moment but i am not even surprised and i i am also disappointed in you guys too if you're out there doing that god yeah like the koroks i know there's a billion of them but they are like my favorite and i love hestu and he does his little dance anyway i'm getting way off topic this is nothing true crime related whatsoever we do have a myriad of topics to discuss today so Call back to our last episode about final meals on death row. We have an article here. It says death row killers, huge 29,000 calorie meal could be biggest ever recorded. And based on like what we talked about in our last meals episode, I'm genuinely, genuinely surprised that he was allowed to order this much food for like to request this much food, especially based on how a lot of prisons got rid of the the infamous last meal because people were getting a little ridiculous with it. Yes, and Gary Carl Simmons Jr. was probably one of the reasons for this because he was executed in 2012 in uh, Mississippi and he was jailed for the murder of Jeffrey Wolf and they called him the Butcher Simmons because he dismembered this guy and he fed him to alligators in 1996. Yeah, this guy was not a nice person. I mean, very rarely are nice people found on death row. So kind of goes without saying for the most part. But he ordered an absolute feast, a ridiculous feast, honestly, more food than you would need for 12 people. Reading the list made me hungry, though. Do you want to get into it? Yes, yes. Let's list it off. All right, so one Pizza Hut medium super supreme deep dish pizza. Double portion with mushrooms, onions, jalapeno peppers, and pepperoni. Pizza, regular portion with three cheeses, olives, bell pepper, tomato, garlic, and Italian sausage. And that was in addition to 10 8-ounce packs of Parmesan cheese, 10 8-ounce packs of ranch dressing, one family size pack of Doritos nacho cheese flavor, 8 ounces of jalapenos nacho cheese, and 4 ounces of sliced jalapeno. Oh my god. Jalapenos. I like that. That's that's fun. I don't know why I'm struggling with this so much. (laughs) Uh, You know what? To be fair, it's literally and figuratively a mouthful. (laughs) It really is. And four ounces of sliced jalapenos. And to wash it all down, he had two large strawberry shakes and two 20-ounce cherry Cokes. And uh, this is along with a supersized order of McDonald's fries with extra ketchup and mayonnaise with two pints of strawberry ice cream. This seems just like he's like, this is my last day on the planet. 
I'm going to be hella vindictive. And whatever mess is created tomorrow when I take my last breath, this is going to be a you problem, not a me problem, because I won't be here to experience it anymore. I want to point out he ate half of it. Yeah, he didn't eat all of it. And like, I think it said in the article uh, that you sent over that he didn't even really bother with his fries. (laughs) Well, I mean, fries, like, I love fries. Like, they're delicious. They're they're yummy. But would I want that as like the last thing I'm ever going to eat? If I have like only a certain amount of room in my belly, am I going to eat fries? I mean, I guess it is kind of a side dish. And this is where uh, Cody and I have a fundamental disagreement. He sees potatoes most of the time as just a filler on the side, where for me, if potatoes aren't involved, I'm not super interested. (laughs) You know, like mashed, fried, whatever. I fucking love potatoes. Scalloped, roasted. I mean, really, you can't go wrong. It seems a crime in itself to forget the fries, in my opinion. But hey. It's not my last meal. What can I say? You know what, though? Eating half of it, though, that's still 15,000 calories. I was going to say, that's probably more than I usually eat in, I don't know, three or four days. So (laughs) I don't know, man. 90 minutes after he was finished this uh, glorious feast, they executed him. And uh, yeah, he's gone now. And that's probably a good thing because this guy was a bad man. Yeah, he wasn't a good man at all. He was 49 at the time of his execution. And maybe he was hoping he would just have like a massive heart attack and uh, die ahead of time. Like maybe he was trying to go out on his own terms. I have no idea. I mean, that's one way to go out. Notoriously, Henry VIII, way, way, way back, allegedly was uh, so fat on his death that when they tried to cram him into his sarcophagus, he exploded. So, you know, there is that too. Fun fact. I mean, it's like a final fuck you. It really is. It really the is. The absolute worst possible because I only, I, I hate that I always go to this, but I think about the smell. And you know what? Smell is one of those visceral things that you cannot escape. And if mm-hmm. you're someone with a very sensitive sense of smell, like I am, the the smallest hint of like garbage on the wind can have me like gagging. So I can't even imagine the smell of a a corpse in less than pristine condition, shall we say? Not uh, n- no, no, thank you, no, thank no, you. Thank I'd rather you. just never know what that smell is like. One hundred percent agree. They we've talked about this before too, and they do say that there's sort of an instinctual thing where even if you've never smelled something like that before. The first time you smell it, you know exactly what it is. And I really hope that day does not come for either of us. I hope that too. And for all of you, dear listeners, unless it already has. You know, your healthcare professionals, things like that. You're probably pretty aware of what that might uh, look and smell like. So kudos to you because it's not for me. But uh, if you're discovering that with, you know, you're not consenting to, hey, I'm going to end up smelling that eventually, then uh, I just hope that never happens. Um, so I was scrolling through the Tiki Talks, as I do, and someone who I was hoping not to see anytime soon did pop up, and it turns out that in Canadian nasty evil human being news, Mr. Paul Bernardo is being moved from his maximum security prison in Ontario to a medium security prison in Quebec, and it's becoming a very controversial thing, as you can probably imagine. Yes. Do we want to get into the difference between the two? Between maximum and medium? Yeah, let's do that, because I'm actually not 100% sure myself. Sure. So maximum security, he does not have contact with anybody else. He may have uh, someone that he shares a cell with, but I don't think that he does. If anyone knows, please correct me on that. But I think from what I was reading, he has been pretty solitary most of the time. So Because the worry is always that someone is going to try to kill him to become famous for being the guy that killed Paul Bernardo. Exactly. And from what I've seen in the articles that I've pulled up, They haven't given an official reason for his move yet, which is pissing some people off. But the theory is, is that he's been moved to a place where typically 
other inmates such as himself who are at danger of being murdered by other inmates go. So, you know, sex offenders, that sort of thing, which he definitely falls under. But here's the thing, like when you're going from maximum to medium, one of the big differences is a big chunk of the time, if not all the time, you are being put into a situation where you now have either dorms where they're all living together in kind of one big room or everyone has a cell, but they all interact interact in like an open concept area and the open concept prisons are something that we do a lot of here but it's he essentially he's going from a situation where he's not going to be around anybody really to being either in an area where he's living around other guys or he's getting a chance to hang out with other guys yeah and the one really interesting thing um that i saw that i hadn't really thought of is that when he was in maximum security in ontario everybody for the most part guards and inmates speak English. Now he's being moved to a Quebec institution where a lot of the guards only speak French and also a lot of the inmates only speak French. So not only is he kind of been thrown back into general population, Paul Bernardo, as far as I know, does not speak French. So this might be very difficult for him as well. I mean, if anything, he's had the time to learn at this point. True, he has been in prison, um, I believe, 29 years so far. Since 1994. Yeah, and he has um, applied for parole twice. It has been denied both times. Thank goodness for that. But yeah, it's it's causing quite a bit of controversy, the fact that he's going to a less, uh, and I shouldn't say a less secure prison, the sense that like he's not going to be able to escape or anything like that. But like you say, a different um, environment, so to speak, for sure. I think a concern for a lot of people is, first of all, what is he going to be like in that situation? But where does it go from here? If they're willing to put him down into medium, are they going to put put him down into minimum where he's able to leave? Are they going to put him down into a situation where he's able to take weekends off? What, what is the next step from here? Because if he's not getting paroled, then they have to do something with him. So what is it going to be if they're already moving him down a, a notch in kind of the, the security situation here? That part is a little concerning for me. And I'm sure also um, the families of his victims are very displeased with this move because we've talked about it a lot before with like uh, capital punishment and the death penalty. We don't have the death penalty up here in Canada, have not for quite some time. But to me... Paul Bernardo fills the criteria of why the death penalty should be in use at some points, in my opinion, because he is an evil piece of shit. And I have no doubt in my mind that if he was to go free today, there would be reoffending within a very short period of time. I would bet money on that. Like, I do not think he is someone that needs to be out in society. I think you have spoiled that for yourself in a disgusting way. You do not get to participate in society anymore. I could not agree more. And I think when I look at him and when I look at this case, he is pretty close to about, I don't know, as close to Ted Bundy as we've gotten to in Canada here. He's yeah. very much that narcissistic, quote unquote, charming guy. He got away with so much stuff before he even murdered anybody. He was out sexually assaulting countless women, not wearing a mask, completely showing his face. He was just absolutely brazen. And there's no reason. I, if you're doing that, you you don't get to be out there anymore with anybody. You know what I mean? Like, you don't get to take that back. 100%. Sir, I get it. you've mm-hmm. hurt a mm-hmm. lot of people. You don't get to just be freewheeling all over the place. No, and the other thing too is every single time he applies for parole, the victim's families have to go and they have to testify and they have to relive everything and that is so unfair. Like that just he doesn't care about anybody besides himself. I I would be shocked to think that he's thinking about anyone but Paul Bernardo at this point. Oh, 100%. I, yeah, no doubt in my mind, 
that he would do awful things given the opportunity. And I think he faced a minor weapons charge in 2018 for somehow having a weapon with him in prison. So it's not like he has a completely clear record. It's not one of those where it's like, well, he's been in prison a long time now and he's really turned himself around. Mm, Doubtful. But at the same time, and we're going to cover these two at some point, it's just such a terrible, terrible, awful case. Uh, but they're on the list. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I think about everything he is trying to pull off right now. But Carla Hamolka. Very true. Yeah. She's I know out there going. trying to, you know, volunteer with children and do this and that. And she's out there having a normal life while he's still doing all of this. And I personally think she belongs in there with him. But that is a whole other point that I could get into for a very, very long time that I'm just not going to uh, put you through right now. <laughs> yes, that this is going to require an entire probably series to get through. Um which we will get into at some point, for sure. I I could rant about these two forever, because it's one of those things where if you are Canadian, you don't necessarily have to be super aware of true crime or, or anything like that. You probably know about this case, because it's just, it's so awful, and it's something that... I mean, they're they're some of the worst that we've seen in Canada. They're absolutely horrific human beings. Because people sort of have this stereotype of, you know, Canadians being so polite and kind and all this stuff. When there is an internationally known true crime case like Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamalka or say Mr. Willie Picton there Mm -hmm. it's like the reason they're internationally known is because they did bad things in a huge way you know whereas I find with the states and of course the population is just so much bigger so statistically speaking there are going to be more more of everything more of the good things but also more of the bad things and Um, speaking of uh Mr. Willie Picton I have run into a few podcast listeners out there in the wild and um they have asked when are we going to cover him oh he is also on the list Uh, and (sighs) He's an interesting one. We'll call him interesting for now, but that's going to be a a long series as well. If you aren't familiar with the case of Mr. Robert Willie Picton, go look him up because he's going to change your perspective on Canadians, I think, a little bit too. We'll Um, get there at some point. That's one of those cases where in Alberta, there's a lot of folks here that are somehow connected to what he did and that's that's one of those cases that is actually quite close to home and uh it is horrible so it's on the list i don't know when soon maybe yeah even i have friends who work for say like the rcmp and stuff like that and some of those officers that have been in on the force for a long time they were called out to help with that case too because when they combed that property It was absolute insanity, but I digress. (laughs) Honestly, I have had a chance to speak to a handful of people at this point who either know him because someone that they knew used to party at the Piggy Palace. Yeah. Or like their aunt did or whoever. Like, it's just one of those things where it's all connected. But anyways. (laughs) Anyways. Yeah. um, Sort of on a similar uh train but not quite another article did pop up that caught our attention do you want to kick this one off sure so it's looking like miss leslie van houten who is uh one of the former charles manson followers she might be freed and it's actually looking like it's gonna happen this time She's actually been recommended for parole five times since 2016, but she was getting denied over and over again. But it's looking like this is going to be overruled. Because in the past, it um, seems like the governor, who would have been Mr. Gavin Newsom at the time, and his predecessor, the governor before him, 
even though the parole has come to them, they as governor have denied the parole each time that she has asked for it. But it looks like because the laws are changing, the District Court of Appeal can actually overrule the governor's denial of parole. So there is a chance that Leslie Van Houten could be out as soon as like this week even. So she has not done a ton wrong since she was incarcerated. I do want to say... During the murders, she put a pillowcase over Rosemary LaBianca's head while Tex Watson stabbed Leno LaBianca. Then Rosemary was stabbed by two of the other followers. We're going to get into all of this in a Charles Manson series that I would love to do as soon as possible. We- I mean, if you have an interest in 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 cults at all you know who the manson family is exactly and i don't want to get into the case a ton here because again it's something we're going to work on in the future but at the end of the day i don't know like this is something where so she was again she was directly involved in all of this she got in trouble a little while ago it was quite a few years ago for trying to communicate with women it was 1981 she was verbally communicating with women she got a write up for doing that but uh she hasn't gotten in trouble since 1981 again so she was one of those people who she was kind of a you know good girl before all of this happened and she and got yeah she was 19 at the yeah. time right so like in my eyes and then this is by no means um am I defending her at all but she was 19 she had been sucked into a cult she was on drugs and you know that's gonna do stuff to a person's brain I will say does that uh, forgive any of it? Absolutely not. She was part of the mo- some of the most horrific attacks ever. But she has been in prison for 50 years. I mean, at the end of the day, they've released people who have done arguably far worse crimes, people who have been involved in far less infamous crimes, if anything. And I think, I don't know, it's it's so hard to say because this is one of those people where they originally wanted to execute all of them. Oh, yes. Yeah, and they then, were all originally sentenced to death, I believe. Yes. So. And I mean, they. I, I think sometimes when they say, okay, you know what? We're not going to put you to death. You're going to spend however long in prison. Do they think about 50 years from then? Because arguably you are not the same person at 19 as you are in your 70s, right? Oh, my God. No. And according to the article here from the Los Angeles Times, she has had decades of therapy, yep. uh, self-help programming. And I believe she also has like her master's in, oh, where was it? Just bear with me. Um, she has her master's degree in humanities, which she did while she was incarcerated. She has worked as a tutor for other uh, inmates and participated in various, you know, self-help and mental health programs. Now, you might be thinking, what is the difference between a case like this and, let's say, Paul Bernardo or something like that? And to me, Paul Bernardo was, if you don't know about the case, I don't want to get too far into it because it is a very difficult one to hear. And that's not the point of this show. Um, But he was out there sexually assaulting very young women for a very long time before he even started murdering. The murders themselves were horrific. And of course, the Manson murders were too. But Leslie Van Houten didn't directly kill anybody that night. That's one of the things is she was there. She helped. She held people. She held them down. Yes. But Paul Bernardo directly murdered people. And it's, you know, it there's Who's to say who deserves what? But at the end of the day, if you're looking at someone like her, who it, you can look at the track record of her trying to get better and trying to do better. You can look at Paul Bernardo and his kind of track record. And it, it's slightly questionable, in my opinion. But I think the problem, though, is if they do release her, what do you do with her? You put her in a halfway house. OK, but she's never going to live a life where she's not constantly looked for or looked at Carla Homolka is absolutely constantly getting doxxed 
Yeah, and whether you think that's righteous or not, she has spent her life, uh, sorry, uh, Leslie Van Houten, um, has spent her life, 50 years of her life from a very young age in a very controlled environment, as have many, many people, obviously, that are serving life. To then bring them back into society, it's never, like you say, it's never going to be normal, right? She she went into this institution as a teenager still at 19, and now she's coming out as a senior citizen. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that huge part of her life that has been spent in a very different environment than than most of us will ever imagine. I think either way, and I say the same for Paul Bernardo, whatever decisions are made for these people, I just hope that there is the right amount of support to back them up Mm -hmm. so that if something bad can happen, that's prevented. You know what I mean? Like if they're going to, if they're putting Bernardo in a different type of area where he is, you know, he's around other people, I hope at least they they know what the fuck they're doing. And it's the same thing with Leslie Van Houten. If they're going to make these decisions, I hope that they are making them with as much information as possible. And I hope that none of this ends horribly. And I don't think she would go ahead and reoffend. Like, I don't see her as someone who would reoffend, but I definitely see her as someone who would probably be put in some kind of a danger. Yeah, just because of how do you learn to live with society again? It would be like spending 50 years in space and then having to come back to Earth and be like a normal person when you've been floating around in the galaxy for 50 years, you know? It's going to have varying stresses on your mental health for sure. The thing is, we're going to have to start getting used to this because we have all of these cases that are famous from, you know, the the 60s to the 80s, even some in the 90s like Bernardo, where the time is coming that parole dates are approaching. Yeah, and I mean, 25 years seems like a very long time when it happens, but I mean... I still think that 10 years ago was 1990 and obviously that's not the case. So time really flies in that sense. It does. We're still waiting to hear about what is going to happen with Luis Garavito this year. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So we have more and more people that are coming up to parole dates or release dates and we'll keep you guys posted with all of them. But, you know, Mark Twitchell the uh, fella that we covered in our very first episode, he's going to be up for release in, uh, what, 2035, I think it was? It, it sounds like a long way away, but it's it's not that long because I always think like, okay, well, I, I turned 30 this year. I graduated high school in 2010. That means I've already been out of high school for 13 years come <laughs> June, um, which still blows my mind because I feel 16 some days. But 2035 is only what 12 years away I think that could be here before we know it and I don't think he's a person that we need to see back on the streets either no and I honestly I want to see what the hell is gonna happen there because I mean with with both of those fellas I mean Luis Garavito that's a right around the corner is what they're at least saying so yes what's gonna happen yeah and he is uh he's a nasty one i mean they all are it's it, you know it's the topic that we've chosen to talk about but for people and again i don't have any previous law knowledge or anything you far surpass me in that particular area because you have an education in that sense with when it comes to you know crime and law and things like excuse me things like that but And I'm not just giving Leslie Van Houten a pass because she's a lady either. I fully think that there's certain ladies behind bars that have also failed to uh, live within a society's rules. But it's just, it feels very different between Paul Bernardo, your Luis Garavito, and then there's Leslie Van Houten. They're very, to me, that's very different cups of tea. Oh, definitely. And I think I would feel the same way if it was um, an old man that was involved in a similar way that she was. Because once again, the crimes are different. They are. They're all terrible. Yes. And I think 50 years, that's a long ass time. But I don't know. What is enough? Yeah. Right. Who are we to say? Absolutely. And I'm sure the families of any victim of a person like this would rather they not be out. And I can absolutely get behind that 100% because it's not for me to decide um, what is enough when it comes to reparations and punishment. 
Agreed. And I think we could talk about that all day, but uh, we're not going to do that. <laughs> no, no. Because we'll, we'll probably wrap it up here. Yes. Because but... what time is it, Charlotte? It is strange death time, beach. Yeah. I got a good one for you. <laughs> I got a good, good, good one for you. I'm excited because I, um, Dina let me know this fella's name, but I have not looked him up. So this is going to be 100% my complete reaction to this story. So I'm excited. Go ahead. All right. So we're taking you all back to uh, March of 1809. Ooh, an old timey. I love it. To the death of John Cummings. And (laughs) this is a cautionary tale. You know, oh. sometimes you should follow your dreams. Sometimes you should aim high and you should, you see something, you want it, you get it, right? But sometimes that's not a good idea. <laughs> oh no, what was John Cummings' dream? I'm, I'm like, my, my brain is racing. So Please tell me. One day John Cummings went to the circus, as one does, okay. and mm-hmm. uh, he saw a knife swallower. And he oh, was like, oh, no. well, shit, I could do that. So he started swallowing knives in his spare time. You know, one day he swallowed uh, four and he was fine. He got three out. You know, okay. he's like, where's the other one? But, you know, you know whatever. three out of four is not bad. 75%. Yeah, that's fine. I'm learning. You know, I'm not going to be perfect when I'm learning. Uh, later, he swallowed 14. And now, yeah, go ahead. Can I just, mm-hmm. okay, so like, uh, when I'm picturing a sword swallower, I'm thinking of like basically a lovely lady in almost like belly dancer gear swallowing a sword to like, you know, the hilt and then, you know, dramatically pulling it back out. Ta da! But the way you're saying it, it makes it sound like he's just eating them. He kind of is. And, and uh, I am going to, when I'm uh, finished telling the tale, I'm going to show you some pictures. Okay. Because okay, uh, they found some, uh, well, some. Of these uh, swords afterwards, right? <laughs> oh, God. Anyways, so, yeah, swallowed 14. A uh, couple days later, he passed all of them. He was fine. You know, all good. It took a few days. He was okay. I think he didn't, they like, realize he had to get them out. Like, he was only doing half of the act. You know what oh, I mean? No. Like, he was, like, yeah. ingesting them. Okay, okay. I mean, I remember my dad telling me a story about a dude from the Guinness Book of World Records that ate, like, a small Cessna airplane. So, you know, some people do have an iron stomach. Yeah. But, um... So, one day he showed up and he was presenting with excessive pain in the stomach. His intestines were just so horribly inflamed that he couldn't even like really walk or stand or anything like that. They started asking him questions and they're like, so what's going on? Um, And he (laughs) said that uh, the the day before he swallowed about 19, maybe 20 clasp knives and a case. He he swallowed the case. He he threw the case back up, but the uh, the knife uh, stayed behind. And all of this entire story takes us to the National Library of Medicine and the National Center of Biotechnology Information. They have all of this written here in a research article called "A Seaman's Wager." Okay. So essentially, he showed up and he said that after he started watching this circus performer, he wanted to start and he was telling people kind of over a few beers what he had done. This was before he ended up at the hospital. And he started bragging that he could do it. And everyone around him was like, no, you can't. And he was (laughs) like, yeah, I can. That is how all of this started. Every single time that he did it, he basically was telling the story of how he had done it the time before and people oh didn't believe him. And every single time he swallowed more and more and more knives. Eventually, they uh, decided to treat him for all of this. He was given castor oil and enemas of what they call a thick water gruel okay. and some opium for the pain. I should hope so. Yeah. And uh, nothing helped. So they started giving him, it says 30 to 40 drops of sulfuric acid in an attempt to dissolve the blades that had remained in his body. 
Man, if you've ever passed like a kidney stone or like a bladder stone, you know that that is probably one of the most uncomfortable things that you can ever experience. And some people it's like cripplingly painful. Now, imagine that it's not just a tiny minuscule kidney stone, but a knife. Yes. And And not just one. (laughs) Pride and ego and a dream, man. Will they, they'll get you into some situations. Oh, they will because he wasn't done there. He vomited some more of it up. Eventually, he wasn't able to eat. That's kind of how all of this ended. He... He had gone to the hospital a few times. They kind of gave him more acid and more opium and this and that. But eventually he died. And uh, I'm going to send you this article now to look at. There is a photo here of fragments of knives that were found in his stomach. And it's a lot of like knife handles. And uh, he was eating them. I guess he just wanted to. This is the problem. He had a dream and he didn't know enough about it to do it properly and instead he just ate a lot of knives oh man i bet you he wished that he would have just like gone for some kind of apprenticeship or something but instead he's like nah how hard could it be i got this and you know to be fair he sure did but uh there was definitely a part of the act like you say that he missed out on completely (laughs) and that is uh safety i think (laughs) maybe he saw the act and he got so excited that halfway through he ran off to go look for knives because he was like i can do this and then as soon as he left they started like bringing them back up so he like missed that part and then that was what happened We've all done things to impress someone, stupid things, Mm -hmm. I should Mm -hmm. say, you know, big or small. We won't get into it too much. I'm sure we all have stories. I feel like it was less to impress the people around him and just for really the kicks that he got out of it until the wager was made, of course. But he was like, sure, I do this all the time. Of course I can do this. I'm willing to bet that a lot of alcohol was involved in this and uh, that just wasn't the best thing to throw into the mix. How sharp were these knives? Because presumably true sort of performing sword eaters I can't imagine that the knife is actually, you know, razor sharp, you know, to a honed point. Well, it says here that a knife blade and a knife back spring were found in his intestines. The spring corroded through into the peritoneum. It transfixed the colon near the left kidney, but uh, it didn't cause any issues. Another blade was wedged across the rectum. Uh, its end oh, no. was embedded in the pelvic wall and they extracted it says 30 to 40 fragments of wood metal and horn once they opened up his belly when i tell you my mouth is wide open right now i'm just like how are you even walking sir i thought you say your mouth mouth was watering (laughs) no absolutely not no i have never had a desire to swallow a knife it sounds to me like he was just eating like you know like a switchblade knife in if that makes sense because you said there is a spring yep i think you know what sometimes we can just say straight up darwinism very true very true survival of the fittest at its best so um john cummings i uh you know sometimes it happens he was 29 when he died that's that's really sad. That's I mean, in those days, not the youngest, but these days, that's still very young. Right? And uh, you know what? Again, proof that uh, sometimes it pays to learn what you're doing before you do it. I support you having a dream, but maybe just like check in with someone that this dream isn't also mental illness. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to Extra Credit today, guys. Hope you enjoyed. And if there's any stories or articles or, you know, news things that you want us to take a look over and discuss, by all means, send them our way. We love to hear what you guys are interesting in hearing from us. Bonus points Uh, if it's old timey. And, uh, you know, sometimes we just can't do a full full series on it or a full episode about it so if you have something that you want us to talk about like don't be shy because we love hearing from you guys uh anything else that we need to talk about today no thank you all so much for listening this has been the grim curriculum extra Extra credit. credit